come along if you feel like happiness is the truth. Da, da, da. Come along if that's what you want to do. Can't nothing bring me down. Can't nothing bring me down. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, family. Welcome to the Mental House with me, your host, Khadija. Uh, I am going to do this article that I picked up from A Shrink for Men. Uh, and it was sent to me by Sister Jennifer. Who uh, is involved with a male borderline or whatever. Like I said, I don't really care about the labels that people use. Because we all got our issues. I know I got mine. Um, but it is the high conflict nature. Uh, and the inability to... Um, be flexible that um, really sticks out with a lot of people when they deal with you know people who are just really really challenging personality wise right so this article was about sex and a person that's high conflict because you know they love to have all this real real intense sex this intense sexual type of relationship and it's um really kind of demonic if you really want to know the truth but anyway let's get here um sex with a borderline is so amazing confusing intensity for intimacy and pathology for passion okay that's really important don't confuse intensity for intimacy and pathology for passion. That's why sometimes you have to really push back on the sex. And look at what you have. Don't let sex be so important that you are neglecting your, your, your sanity, I should say. In the, okay, I'm in the relationship, but the sex is the best I ever had. These are some of the things that people say. It's like porno sex. She was like an animal. She wanted it all the time. She did the most outrageous things to me. We had sex in the restaurant bathroom stall on the first date. Okay? We used to have sex all the time. She couldn't get enough. Now it's infrequent. And when we do have sex, it's like it's a chore. The relationship is horrible. I think about leaving a lot, but we still have sex several times a week. Most of my married friends complain that they never get any. You know the saying, crazy in the head, crazy in bed. <laughs> Normal women or men just don't compare it to sex with a borderline or a narcissist. Now, though, these are the things that I said. Let me say something about sex in my opinion. Whenever you have a conflict, I have spoken on this before. When you have conflicts with people and you're able to resolve the conflicts, um, work through them, not ignore them, not shut down and run away and you know deal with it. And if you don't act like it didn't happen, it didn't happen. Usually, those relationships last, and the people become closer. Right? But sex with these people that are high conflict, if you never have the chance to work out the conflicts at all, then sex becomes like a serious turn off from them. Because it's almost impossible to have sex with somebody unless you just have a prostitute or somebody that you pay, you know, easy transaction, you know, it's, it's, it, if you have feelings for the person, 
it's kind of hard to share all these other feelings and have some feelings not resolved because you might as well back up out of that because you're gonna you're not gonna feel complete. And then if you continue on to have sex and all these other things aren't worked out and you feel insecure in other areas. It's not going to bring the intimacy that you want. It's not going to bring the closeness that you need to solidify a relationship, right? So, codependent, please. Each time a client mythologizes sex with a borderline or narcissistic partner, ex, uh, my eyes roll so hard you think that there were a pinball spring mechanism in my eye sockets. Sure. Some personality disorder individuals are hypersexual during the love bombing stage of the relationship. Then, after you've legally bond yourself to them in some way, either marriage, children, um, telling them that you love them, whatever, that party's over. No sex for you. It's like a drug dealer giving a customer all the crack they can smoke for free and, until they get good and addicted. Then, the addict pays... And pays dearly. Some narcissists and borderlines remain sexually demanding throughout the relationship duration. In these cases, it's more a matter of quantity versus quality, possession and control. But I'll get into that later. Ideally, sex is an important part of a healthy and loving relationship. Sex can drive a very person, can vary from person to person. As long as a couple is willing to communicate, respect, and consider each other's needs, it doesn't have to become an unsolvable issue. That is, provided that neither partner has hang ups or dysfunctional attitudes about sex going back to childhood and or religious beliefs. But that's not what this article is about, okay? I just don't want y'all to confuse intimacy and intensity okay and pathology for passion intensity is the hallmark of relationships with narcissist people but or, or people that are just characterologically disturbed okay like I said these labels get to me their their extreme personalities with extreme dysregulated emotions. Okay, and oftentimes extreme chaotic drama filled relations and histories. Look at the histories of their relationships. When telling you their history on the first 12 hour phone call um, or 180 page text message, they often present themselves as a victim of someone or Many times, someone's exes, parents, colleagues, professors, a neighbor's pet, hedgehog, you get the idea. Sharing that much information, particularly trauma history, on the first conversation or meeting is an example of their intensity and lack of boundaries. So it's a huge honking red flag. It is. <coughs> Instant emotional and sexual intensity can accelerate the, inf the formation and bond of an attachment, albeit usually a very unhealthy one. The intensity is a manifestation of their pathology, not the capacity of their ability to love and have passion. The instantaneously intense intensity upon first meeting the narcissist borderline or psychopath can feel so seductive, hypnotic, and in some cases even euphoric. This is what some people confuse for chemistry. Or, as a male borderline put it, I once briefly dated in my early 30s. I called it crazy chemistry. Emphasis on the crazy. Anyone who's been in a relationship with a borderline woman or man knows this isn't hyperbole. I dated him for approximately four months and wrote a 300-page book about it that I never published entitled Insanity Inc. That 75 pages worth of crazy per month. <laughs> but I digress. 
emotional intensity without any depth. It can be in indicative of the characterological pathology. It's easy for someone to confuse intensity with emotion. The depth of emotion, but they're quite different. Emotional depth isn't a flash or a lightning and disappears as quickly as it appears. Once developed, it's actually a consistent character attribute. Okay? Vulnerability, trust, and emotional attunement, or the lack thereof. Genuine emotional intimacy and sexual intimacy, if nurtured and protected, can be deep, lasting, and mutual. They grow gradually over time as two, two people grow to understand, to know, and to trust each other and enjoy each other again. They're not the fast, projected, riddle fantasy land sexual experiences that the typical, intense, and oftentimes personality disorder orders. Again, intimacy grows over time. It requires reciprocity, trust, emotional attunement, and the willingness to be vulnerable with another human being. So if you have a lover that you can't say anything to, and you're afraid they're going to leave you, so that for you walking on eggshell, because you know if you make them mad, they're going to leave and they ain't going to come back, or this, that, what are you doing? And how long can you go on this way? I mean, emotional depth, it really does involve um, the capacity to experience the range of emotions. Not just mad, glad, sad, bored, and distinguished amongst all of them. It also requires a sophistication in comprehending one's emotion, their origin. Something from the past or the present. And the ability to understand and relate to another's emotions through attunement and empathy. This is why so many narcissists, borderlines, histrionics, or other emotionally immature people call you their soulmate on Monday and post selfies with their new soulmate on Thursday. That's why they do it. That's why they tear you, tear your clothes off one minute you walk through the door uh, and during a love bombing and seduction stage and couldn't be more turned off by you after you become emotionally dependent upon them. Right? It's not healthy. Specifically, dependent on them in order to feel good about yourself. Their emotions may appear, but are in fact remarkably shallow. Like a three-year-old proclaiming, you're the best mommy, daddy, one minute. And then screaming, I hate you, mean mommy, mean daddy, the next. Because you won't buy them a toy. What makes emotionally immature reciprocal relationships and mutually satisfying um, or profoundly satisfying possible? What makes that possible? <clears throat> well, there's many variables. Uh, vulnerability. Being vulnerable is a risk. When you reveal your authentic self, taking down the walls, you share your needs and desires. You risk being rejected or ridiculed. Some people are able to do this with relative ease. But if you come from a dysfunctional family in which you were neglected, rejected, and felt inadequate or not enough, you uh, you were ridiculed when expressing yourself or abused, the prospect of being authentically vulnerable can be terrifying. Unfortunately, many clients with these families of origins experiences choose the wrong adult partners for whom to be vulnerable, namely Individuals who are assimilating to the dysfunction or disordered parent who inflicted the wounds in the first place. D. Think about that. 
you are basically looking for a corrective outcome in your relationship as you were with your parents. Narcissists and borderlines typically don't do vulnerability. Just because they do data dump when you begin dating doesn't mean they're being vulnerable or truthful for that matter. The initial oversharing is a power tactic and that serves a, a, a couple's purpose. First, they're data mining you. Why? Because it's all the better to manipulate you and hurt you later. Second, it serves to get you to feel safe enough to be vulnerable, to let your guards down and create a fast bond. Look at how much she trusts you to open up to you so quickly. She must really think you're special. It must be safe for you to do so, to open up too, right? Wrong! Furthermore, if he or she tells you that they never had sex with someone as fast as they did with you, then I got a bridge for sale in Brooklyn that's perfect for you. And I'll show it to you right after that I stop rolling my eyes. They start telling you, you the best they ever had. Uh, you don't love their life, but then they dump you and run. You already know it was a love bomb. It's hard to accept, but it's true. I know. I know. Trust. You trust your partner, and your trust. You trust that your partner is accepts you to have your back and best interest at heart. You trust them to not deliberately hurt you, to be accountable, and to express remorse when they do hurt or disappoint you, and vice versa. Without trust, it ain't safe to be vulnerable. Even though you think you love the person, you don't trust them. Once the trust has been broken, it can be difficult, if not impossible, to rebuild. Particularly if your partner rarely or never apologizes. Or rarely ever takes accountability, nor makes amends for their hurtful and destructive behavior. Even so, a narcissist or borderline expects you to continue to blindly trust and remain vulnerable to them. It's easier for them to inflict pain and manipulate you that way. I mean, I, I, honestly, and that is the most powerful, truest statement. That's like, I, I know of a situation where um, the, when I broke up with the, uh, uh, um, well, at this point, I think the person, I don't know what kind of characterological default it was because I track them. Um, and until I got into the apex of until I got to the heart of the matter, I used to attract them all the time. Right? So, um, though these things, once you realize, you're like, oh, I was broke up with you and for a week and you start seeing somebody else or you moved in with somebody else. Or you let somebody move in with you. And I didn't do anything anything of that nature because I was thinking I'm supposed to be trying to figure out where we went wrong. That's that's what my love do. My heart is trying to figure out. Cause, and I definitely don't want to take no baggage into another situation. So if you got to, some people tell you, oh, the best way to forget about a new relationship is jump into a new one. Well, yeah, okay. I would rather think about what went wrong first. But when you got a personality disorder person, they're sleeping with everybody and then get mad when they find out that you slept with one person. They get mad. Well, you found, and then you're looking at them like, didn't you leave me and move somebody in your house? Or didn't you 
Move in with so and so. Nothing makes sense. Your eyes will be a perpetual pinball machine. So if you stop when you and if you and when you wise up and stop trusting them and stop sharing your thoughts and feelings, they accuse you of all manners of misdeeds. You're an emotionless robot. You're a liar. You're hiding something. You're cheating. You're cheating. Good luck explaining their behavior is the reason that you no longer trust them to uh, enough to be vulnerable to them. By the way, never jade. If y'all want to know what jade means, never justify, argue, defend, and explain. I used to do that. But not with these individuals. It makes no sense. Don't justify. Don't argue. Especially when you got enough ammunition and enough instances where you already know what's going on. <coughs> Narcissists and borderlines, <coughs> they don't really trust people. Why? Because they're human projection machines. They project their they project their selfish, cruel, scheming, and dishonest qualities upon others. They know they're untrustworthy and judge everyone else by their own twisted yardstick. Ironically, while they're loyal to no one, they have a narcissistic rage when anybody betrays them. This is so so true. <laughs> By betray, I mean anyone who exposes their true tired of abuse and ends the relationship and are no longer willing to enable them to be complicit in their cruelty or their exploitation. They don't want it. They don't want you. Even if the narcissist or borderline doesn't cheat on you, they're inherently disloyal. Betrayal applies to so much more than infidelity. Lying is betrayal. Throwing you under the bus to project themselves is betrayal. To protect themselves. Smearing you and claiming to be a victim. Same thing. And I couldn't believe it because you don't want to think that somebody that you support, that you love, is out here smearing you every chance they get to your children, to your friends. But that's what they're doing. And it's a hard pill to swallow. It's a hard, hard pill to swallow. And, um,. All these things. Um, all these things. Uh, is. I mean. Is, is, is really hard on the heart. Because. When these people are making up stuff. That, that, that you know is not true. And you trauma bonded with them. And you oh you have a certain amount of codependency, fear, obligation, and guilt, and it's those things that make it hard to uh to end those kind of relationships. You know um so you know you have to be emotionally in tune with somebody, and that's what makes a healthy relationship possible. It isn't mirroring. Engaged in by narcissists or borderlines during love bombing, which they create a superficial sense of rapport and intimacy. Emotional attunement is the experience of feeling empathy for connection and of oneself and others. It's the former prerequisite of the latter. Emotional entombment is the ability to hear, see, sense, interpret, and respond to someone both verbally and non-verbally. This is how we communicate to people that we are close to so that we see them, feel them, and understand their experiences. In practice, though, attunement is when we engage with someone else's feelings. And in the moment, they feel us. They, you know, we are no longer alone. 
but we're connected. I know a lot of y'all don't want to talk about this, and I know this video is a little long, but this is why we call it the mental house, y'all. Because if you don't start with the man in the mirror, and you don't start right in your own home and with your own self, we don't got a chance. We don't have a chance in starting your thinking, thinking, and your crazy relationships, especially when you're involved with people that you love them, and or you've trauma bonded, which is one of the most hardest traumas, bonds that you can possibly have with somebody, because you feel like y'all know each other inside out. You don't want to let go. But in the end, when you see how it's tearing you apart, and when you see you're not moving forward, the person doesn't know how to grow up and you're still dealing with the same vulnerable, crazy issues that you've had for 30 years or 20 years, it's okay to get divorced. It's okay to live the rest of your life. You know, it may be difficult, but it'll get greater. As long as you keep pushing for it, as long as you keep pushing for something, some sanity in your life. You know, I just know that um, narcissists, borderline, whatever you want to call them, they ain't capable of uh, emotional attunement. They're not, I repeat, empaths. They're not. It's like calling serial killers great humanitar humanitarians. These individuals are typically so self-absorbed that they can't see past their own self-inflicted suffering to acknowledge the pain that they cause others. Because no one suffers as much as borderlines or narcissists, and certainly not their victims. Just ask the diagnosed self-aware ones. Okay? They are, just ask them. In respect, they're still infants. Good enough parents are emotionally attuned. Good parents are emotionally attuned to the child. Children are primarily focused on themselves and their emotional states, not their parents. When they consider their parents' emotions, etc., it's still egocentric. For example, mom seems upset. Probably not a good time to ask her for $20. <laughs> Adult infants and toddlers expect the same one-way care, concern, and interest from their partners. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... I was always told that a tree is known by the fruit it bears. You know? So, remember that. When you're choosing a partner, look at the families. Look at the situation. You know, if they have children. If they have children and, and they're floating around like tumbleweeds in the desert. All those things. Because it may have been attributed to to the parents not being able to communicate good. You might say, what does this pertain to having crazy sex with crazy? Well, narcissists and borderlines are often capable of seeing any viewpoint other than their own. On the rare occasion they acknowledge your views, wants, or needs, they're, uh, if they're an obstacle to getting to what they want, too bad for you. Even when getting your needs met doesn't cost them anything, time, effort, or simply doing nothing, they'll actively undermine it. Your misery, codependent, brokenness makes it more difficult to end the unhealthy relationship because trauma bonds are very difficult to break. They may also derive pleasure in denying your wants and needs out of spite and malice. So if you've trauma bonded with somebody, they really get a kick out of how you, 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 you're hurt. They like that. To be clear, these individuals are self-obsessed and selfish in the extreme. How can someone who's so wrapped up in him or herself and their own feelings possibly be amazing in bed? Beyond cheap theatrics and practice techniques, Really think about that. All that hooping and hollering and hey, 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 all that. 
Look, if you're not seeking a deep and lasting emotional, intellectual, psychological, and physical connection, then by all means, keep surfing the sea of BPD and NPD. The only shores of it. The shores are, are teaming up with them, and they're generally ready and easily available, despite what they claim. Unless they're playing hard to get, so you'll give them an eagle yummy by chasing after them. If you want something healthier, meaningful, mutually satisfying, and enduring, then you just got to level up. You got to level up. So I don't know whose um, spirit or somebody I might have touched with this because I know it's a long video. But somebody's in a situation right now that they're questioning. Should I really be here? And I don't care if it's been 20 years. You might have to break up with somebody you've been with 20 years. 25 years. 15 years. 10 years. You might have to. If you're traveling down the road and you realize you're going the wrong way, you're going to keep going the wrong way? Think about it. Think about it. I'm going to see, uh, again, this little article came, it was published by Shrink for Men with Dr. T. Um, I think she does great work with coaching and consulting. Give her a call. If you don't give her a call, give somebody a call. Start dealing with your relationships. Find out where they're weak at. Can they stand up? Can they stand up to any scrutiny? And if it's because you're not having sex that they can't, then that's the alternative for them to figure out why aren't we? All right, family. With that being said, if you like what you hear, I'm going to be back with a part two of this. Um, but if you like what you hear, please subscribe and please share it to this uh, channel. Because we're trying to deal with our mentals. Our mentals are so important. I'll see you in the next video.